Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryan over there, and there's Dylan, the guest producer again. And this is Stuff You Should Know, the podcast mm-hmm. about Chuck, some pretty heady stuff. Yeah, I could have sworn we did this one. No. What did we do, Roswell? No. UFOs? Yes. We did that at a Comic-Con or something, right? Yeah, we did. We did it live. I've never been satisfied with that one. I, I agree. Maybe we'll redo it one day. Nah, this is good. This, this, this Area 51, um, I think this kind of covers some ground that I didn't think... I was surprised by this, is what I'm saying. Yeah, me too. And I think the thing that... I would wager you were surprised about, which I was definitely surprised about, was just how mundane the explanations for what goes on at Area 51 probably is. Yeah, secret government research. The end. Right. (laughs) But it it probably doesn't have anything to do with reverse engineering alien technology and the secret seat of the one world government, the Majestic 12, probably isn't located there. No, probably Um, just bombs and planes. Probably. It makes sense. And the if there is a conspiracy going on, the one conspiracy theory I saw for Area 51 that made the most sense to me is that it's actually meant to be a distraction or has developed into <laughs> a distraction mm-hmm. for some other place that no one even knows about. Area 50? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Hopefully they're not quite that on the nose, but it's possible. All right. So let's go back in time, I guess. Um to World War II. Mm-hmm. And, well, first of all, Area 51, just to g- geographically level set, it's um, less than 100 miles from Las Vegas in Nevada. South South Nevada. Yeah, it's 600 square miles. Um, and it's basically, if you look at it on Google Earth, it looks like a, you know, a big airfield with a bunch of buildings. So the I think the whole restricted airspace that's part of like the test range and the air base and all of that stuff yeah. that air, the Area 51 is located in, I think that's 600 square miles. I'm pretty sure Area 51 itself is no more than 60 square miles. Oh, yeah, sure. Just the, like the, it's not like there's 600 square miles of buildings. Right, it's just, no, this, no, what, no. yeah, the the installation that people think of as Area 51 is, is part of a larger, right. huge, big chunk of the American desert uh, in Nevada. Right, so uh, next to Area 51 is what's, what you were kind of talking about, the Nevada test site. Mm-hmm. And this is where, for about 10 or 11 years, the Atomic Energy Commission um, was setting off nuclear bombs. <clears throat> Um, underground, above ground, mm-hmm. and uh, really sort of figuring out how to kill a lot of people very easily right. in sort of the most dangerous way you could imagine. Yeah, and you could see this from Vegas. Like, they would have parties when they were doing the test because Vegas is like 80 miles away or something like that. And they would have, like, a- atomic cocktails and viewing parties <laughs> and stuff like that, and people would wow. watch them shoot off bombs. Unbelievable. Right. Um, but this is... Obviously, a part of the country that the government would be very interested in keeping people away from, not just for the bombs, but because of the um, the fallout, the radiation, but also the fact that they're testing like super sensitive military equipment and um, weapons, right? Like atomic bombs. Yeah, like previous to this, it was just land. It was uh, there were silver mines, there was cattle mm-hmm. and wildlife. But then in 1940. Uh, the government said, no, this is ours, and we're going to train uh, bombers here. Right. Uh, and there was a big bombing range, and they were split into different numbers, and that's where the, the number Area 51 comes from, which seems, I don't know about arbitrary, but no one knows uh, if it really matters why it was named Area 51. No, I think it was, if you look at old bombing range maps, it just the, the area where Area 51 is located was denoted as Area 51. That's, Between 50 and 52 is probably the answer. <laughs> yeah, that's basically, from what I saw, that was it. Yeah, so uh, there's another part to this story with World War II, and this is Germany. Um, they were a bit ahead of us as far as jets go. Um, jet airplanes. Yeah. Um, the United States was like, this won't do at all. So we're going to get um, kind of put the gas on our jet development. And in 1943, Lockheed um, said, 
was was tasked with developing a jet fighter plane. You can use a British jet engine, uh, and they tasked engineer Kelly Johnson, said, get a team together. He got a team together, and they delivered the P-80 Shooting Star, which is one of the coolest-looking uh, old jets. All the all these planes are just amazing-looking. Agreed. Very, yeah, very cool. It's a good idea. When we talk about a new jet or something, go look it up as we're talking about because most of them are pretty boss-looking. Yeah, I've never been a plane guy, but I'm getting more and more into it. Is that right? Yeah. I want to do a stealth bomber episode one day, okay? Possibly the coolest plane. Yeah. So um, Kelly Johnson was a— that that just that right there delivering America's first jet on like under time and under budget was huge, and he became a, a legendary engineer right off the bat. Um, and they, I think Lockheed said, "Hey, how would you like to keep this pace up? We'll give you your team of elite engineers, whatever funding you need, whatever resources you need. Just ask; you can have it, um, and you just keep developing stuff really quickly for us." Um, and we will put you at the cutting edge of aviation research. And so Kelly Johnson and his team eventually became known as the, the Skunk Works, which is legendary in aviation engineering because they developed a, a whole bunch of really cool stuff. But also they had a pretty great name, too, that was fairly intriguing. But they were the first ones to kind of basically develop agile project management, from what I understand. Yeah, and this was all out of the what was known as Site 1, which was in Burbank, California, mm -hmm. um, just sort of a suburb of L.A. Uh, but then in 1954, they said, you know what we need now is a spy plane. Uh, the CIA wants a spy plane. We want something that can fly above radar um, and photograph Soviet military bases, uh, missile installations. Mm -hmm. We're going to name it because we name everything. Uh, Project Aquatone, and that's where Johnson and his team developed the U-2, um, the Skunk Works team. Right. But they couldn't do this at Site 1 anymore because right. it had to be super, super secret, obviously, because it was a spy plane. So they needed a different place, and that's where that sort of all converges onto this uh, testing site in Nevada. Yeah. Uh, Kelly Johnson, a uh, CIA officer named Richard Bissell, and uh, a couple of pilots— started scouting locations for where they could develop this in super, super secret. And they, they went to look at the old um, Nevada test range. And specifically, the thing that attracted them was a dry salt lake called Groom Lake. And one of the pilots recounted taking some like 16-pound shot put balls and dropping them on the ground to see just how sandy the ground was. And it, it, he said it was solid as a tabletop, this lake was, the dry lake. Yeah. They were like, this will probably do. And there's a, a lot of reasons why it would do, not just because there was a dry lake bed that was as hard as concrete, but because it was in an area that was already off limits to the public. Um, the airspace was already restricted. It was remote. Um, there are two mountain ranges that shield the, um, the test site from view. So this area, what became known as Area 51, was just perfect for developing a super-secret spy plane in super-secret. And so the CIA and um, the Skunk Works team said, this will do. Let's take this place over. Did I ever tell you about one of the most fun things I ever got to do as a PA? What? <laughs> Wait, didn't, weren't you arrested by Eric Estrada? Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> oh, no. That's top 10. Okay. Um, we did a, a, a car shoot on a dry lake bed oh, yeah? in Death Valley. Nice. And they had a, like a big, huge line of cars in a row, all driving in perfect synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And the director wasn't happy, and they were like, we want uh, all the dust is behind them. He went, I want dust in front of them. So the AD ran and grabbed the keys to a Mustang threw them to me, and he said, get in that Mustang and drive 100 feet in front of them as fast as you can, fishtailing and doing donuts and stuff. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I was like, me? Yeah. Oh, man, it was so much fun. Because it's a dry lake bed. It's like there's just no fear of hitting anything or flipping. Like you could just do whatever you wanted. It was wonderful. That's cool. It was so much fun. Did You didn't hit a jackrabbit or anything, did you? Uh, Just a couple. <laughs> No, it was fine. It was it was a lot of fun. So, what was the last thing you said? The Super last secret. Thing, yeah, the last <laughs> thing. I, well, I was talking about how amazingly perfect Area yeah. Fifty One is for developing a super secret spy plane. Yeah. So they called it Paradise Ranch, and the locals around there they were used to because of all the atomic bomb testing. It kind of worked out because 
they weren't going to, first of all, it was in the middle of nowhere, but even the nearby communities, the ones that were close enough, mm-hmm. it just wasn't on anyone's radar because they had always been doing weird things out there. So it's not like it, it, it pricked up anyone's ears. So it was kind of the perfect cover to be there at Paradise Ranch doing these uh, development of these spy planes and stuff. Right, right. They so, but in addition to that, the cover story initially that the CIA produced was that they were a team of um, bomb experts yeah. who were cleaning up unexploded munitions from the time when it was used as a bombing range. So that was why that was the story they used for why there was a sudden appearance of like trucks and people when there there hadn't been really much of anything there before. Yeah, there were, there were also. Uh, Natural barriers. There were a a couple of mountain ranges that kind of shielded it from view. Mm -hmm. Um, It was already remote. The airspace was already restricted. And then Eisenhower came along and signed Executive Order uh, 10633 in 1955, which basically extended the airspace over Area 51. And then in 1958, a public land uh, order made this, basically said this area doesn't exist anymore. Right. It's not on maps. It's not acknowledged. And this is one of the huge reasons why Site 2, the ranch, Area 51, has been so, um, and and we'll see later, things have changed a little bit in recent years, but just for the government to say, like, I don't know what you're talking about over and over again, is sort of crazy making. It is. But, like, they would, as we'll see later, they will they would say in open court this, the the place where this person claims to work does not exist. I like, know. in court. And um, the, the judge would just be like, what are you, how, what, how are we going to get around this? This is a real problem. Um, but that, from what I read, Chuck, originally, Area 51 was a CIA installation. Yeah. And around 1970, it transferred hands to the Air Force. But from, from what I could tell, up until that point or at least the first several years in the mid to late 50s and early 60s um, no one had any idea that Area 51 existed they did a really good job of keeping that place a genuine secret not an open secret like it became later on but a real secret and one of the ways that they did that was they they from from what workers later said in like testimony in court cases is that like they would be interrogated at gunpoint to see if they were actually spies. There yeah. were all sorts of like weird loyalty tests and things like that. And um, while they were working on the U-2 spy plane uh, in particular, they kept that secret so serious that if you were out there working um, and you had nothing to do with the U-2 program, you were just a worker, or you were working on a different program, they would move you indoors, yeah. close the doors, close the blinds on the windows before rolling the U-2 out or testing it. Like you were not allowed to be outside or look. Yeah, uh, that, that was pretty, like, remarkable. I, I, like, within Area 51, they even had sub-security mm-hmm. protocols in place. Um, yep. I kind of just figured, like, if you were in there, then you had access to the alien room, <laughs> the, right? you know, all the good stuff. Right, but, but think about that, because to even be on the base or in Area 51, you had to have the highest level of security clearance you could possibly have yeah. just to work on there. And even if you had that, you still couldn't see the U-2 spy plane or know that it existed or hear people talk about it. They wouldn't even let Bono in on it. Nope. So that was a terrible joke. It was really bad. I was really hoping we can get around that one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the U-2 spy plane uh, was great uh, until it wasn't, and that mm-hmm. was when uh, Francis Gary Powers was shot down in 1960, and the plane uh, was all of a sudden in the so- the hand of the Soviets. Yeah. And uh, they basically were like, well, that's the end of that. Uh, you can't have a secret spy plane anymore once it's in the hand of the Soviets. Um, and it was also <laughs> a big deal because uh, the American people all of a sudden knew that the, the U.S. government is definitely doing things in total secret and developing technology yeah. that no one knows about. It was a surprise to everybody, not just the Soviets, but also the the American public, like you were saying, too. And I looked to see if this was looked upon by historians as like the point where Americans realized that the government did things in secret that the American public didn't know about. And I didn't see anything like that. So I don't know if this is an Ed comment or what, but it makes sense. And certainly people didn't know that the U-2 spy plane existed. The CIA did a really good job of keeping it secret. But 
when it was out, um, it was pretty humiliating for the U.S. And it was also a big deal that this spy plane was shot down because I, Eisenhower had approached Khrushchev, Khrushchev and said, hey, why don't we maintain an open airspace policy to one another so we can keep tabs to make sure that either side is keeping our word with our, you know, armament treaties and the stuff we're doing. Like, we're enemies, but um, maybe we should kind of be able to keep tabs on one another. And Khrushchev said, no, there's not going to be any open airspace policy. And so the the United States went and developed this U-2 spy plane instead. And when it got shot down, flying over restricted airspace of an enemy, that's an act of war. And it could have gone way differently than it did. But instead, it was a big humiliation for the United States. And instead of just kind of tucking tail and running... The guy who was in charge of it for the CIA, Richard Bissell, went to the government and said, hey, I've got an idea. Let's get even more secret and develop an even more secretive plane under an even more secretive project. And that, the government said, hey, let's do it. We're scared of the Russians. We'll double down. We'll triple down if you want, buddy. And that became Project Oxcart. That's right. Uh, and that was a, a black project. Mm-hmm. And it was so secret and so concealed that no one was even allowed to know how much money was being spent. Yeah, this is a big a big turning point here. It was. I mean, this kind of started the era that we still live in today, which uh, in which the military just dumps money into secret projects uh, where there's um, that, that don't exist as far as anyone knows and that there's very little oversight for. Right, exactly. It's really interesting. Yep, and apparently it was this Richard Bissell's idea. All right, well, let's take a break. Old Dick Bissell. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll get back to Dick Bissell and the rest of Oxcart right after this. <laughs> So one of the problems with, I guess it's not a problem if you're, you're comfortable with dumping money into a project, but one of the, I guess, expenses of a super, super secret project is that it just costs a lot more. Um, background checks take time and cost money. Uh, putting something in a super remote location costs money. Um, having extra security forces, and it all just costs a lot more money. I mean, it's a, it's a serious multiplier on cost to do something that, quote-unquote, doesn't exist. Right. But in addition to that, Chuck, too, is just the fact that uh, the the technology that was being developed was so cutting-edge, it just by definition required even more money on top of the extra money for it being so super secret. Yeah, so Oxcart eventually led to the SR-71 Blackbird, Mm -hmm. another amazingly cool plane. Probably the coolest of all time, if you ask me. Yeah, I said the stealth bomber earlier, but the SR seventy one is that it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Although there is another one later on that I'll I'll mention. Uh, the, well, I'll go ahead and say the bird of prey stealth jet. You like that one, huh? It's pretty cool. It looks a little bit like a super cool tongue depressor. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I know what a tongue depressor is. It, this looks like that, like a flying gray tongue depressor. It's like a popsicle stick, though, right? Um, yeah, but wider. Okay. <laughs> but the SR-71 Blackbird, definitely not a popsicle stick. No, no, it's just cool. Plus, it, it doesn't hurt the fact that G.I. Joe, well, Cobra, technically, had the SR-71 <laughs> Blackbird as one of their planes. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, so, Oxcart, um, they needed better infrastructure, basically, and it, it was they, they couldn't just pour money into the development of the jet at this point. They had to really update all the facilities, expanding on land, expanding in more restricted airspace even. That happened in 1962. Mm-hmm. And it, it just sort of, I think, ingrained the super permanence of Area 51. And also, like, the fact that, like, the government said, no, okay, this was a humiliating thing to have our U-2 shot down, rather than maybe we'll just kind of take another tack. They really went further down the path of just completely secret black projects. And they, they developed some pretty pretty amazing stuff there. Um, the uh, I think you were saying the Bird of Prey? That was from the 90s, right? Yeah, I think it's cool looking. The F-117 Nighthawk? That's the one that's like a single wing stealth bomber, I believe. Yes. 
And yeah. this is also where they uh, take, and um, like if you capture an enemy plane, you will take that to Area 51 to to check out as well. Yeah, there's another program at Wright-Patterson Base in Dayton that's like sp- set up specifically for that, but I wonder if this is like even more highly sensitive. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yeah, they've captured MiGs before, captured radar systems, and they reverse engineered them there, which will come into play later on. Um, and then there was another one called the uh, Tacit Blue Stealth Bomber. So basically any stealth uh, aircraft, whether it was the Stealth Blackhawks or the Stealth Bombers that were developed from the 60s onward, um, it was probably developed and tested in super secrecy in Area 51. Right. So, like I said, this made it just sort of uh, a shop that they w- that wouldn't close, essentially, at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, in 1993, there w- there's an area known as Freedom Ridge, a uh, very ironic name because Freedom Ridge was uh, <laughs> taken by the government <laughs> right. and closed off to the public. And this is where uh, tinfoil hats uh, used to gather with their binoculars to try and check out things. Mm-hmm. And they said, no more. Uh, Freedom Ridge is now ours. <laughs> it's called Get Out of Here Ridge. Yeah. Shot on sight Ridge. <laughs> That's right. So um, if you are like, get to the aliens, what are you guys even talking about? The aliens in Area 51, as synonymous as they are now, and they are synonymous, the highway that Area 51 is off of, that oh, the yeah. road to Area 51 is off of, has been officially renamed by the state of Nevada as the Extraterrestrial Highway. <laughs> like it's Highway 305. Yeah. As synonymous as this base is with aliens and UFOs, that's actually relatively recent. It was operating for a good 25, 35 years, I think, um, before aliens became tied to Area 51. And there's actually a moment in time that you can point to where it happened. And it happened on a broadcast in May of 1989, almost just past 30 years ago, on KLAS, the local Las Vegas um, TV network. I'm not sure what network affiliate they are, but they had like their five o'clock news and on it, they interviewed a guy who was anonymous, went by the pseudonym Dennis, and he basically said, hey, I'm doing a lot of weird stuff out there at Area 51. Let me tell you all about it. Yeah, his name, his real name was Bob Lazar. And he, uh, have you seen interviews with this guy? Yeah. Did you see the, the more recent one? No, the but the one where he said, I think it was a good idea, that one? No, I'm, I'm talking about, there was one just from a few years ago. No. Um, it, it, I got to say, I mean, I'm not a conspiracy guy at all. Right. But when you listen to Bob Lazar talk today, he just doesn't seem like some crackpot or a weirdo or like he would be lying. He hasn't like made money off of this or mm-hmm. like... He he's he's basically like, listen, man, I, I kind of wish this wasn't attached to my name because I'm trying to run a business in Michigan, and it doesn't <laughs> help that people think I'm some UFO kook. Bob Lazar's alien apples. And he said, <laughs> 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 oh, good. And he said, uh, but he was like, uh, you know, everything th- that I told you was true, though, and that's just the deal, uh, you know, and, and I don't care if anyone believes me. He's kind of like that, though, too, in the early interviews. Um, at the very least, he's very calm and not at all kooky or anything like that. It's specifically the stuff he was talking about that was yeah. so compelling. Yeah, so his story is, um, and you can go watch this stuff for yourself and see it all, but he basically explains how he's an engineer and he uh, was working on reverse engineering um, uh flying saucers, essentially, alien mm-hmm. spacecraft and alien technology. And at one point, he was in a room and they left him alone with all these files that describe alien technology and alien autopsies mm-hmm. and all of this stuff. And uh, it's pretty remarkable to listen to. It didn't make the hugest waves because it was 1989. And it was a local news station. At first, it didn't. Yeah, and then it was picked up by Japan, oddly enough. Mm-hmm. And after it went to Japan, it went kind of worldwide. And before you know it, um, the whole area just sort of became alien central. And this is, we should point out, this also has a lot to do with the fact that in the 70s and 80s, 
the United States kind of went UFO nuts. Oh, yeah, man. There were so many great books at the time that were coming out that claimed everything from, like, UFOs were responsible for the Bermuda Triangle yeah. or a- a- Atlantis was populated by UFOs or the Nazca lines were for UFOs or the Egyptians built the pyramids with UFOs. All that stuff came out of the 70s and 80s. Yeah. So this all kind of coincided with Lazar um, having his news interview, and it, and it really just kind of changed everything. It did, right? So he kind of like came out at a time when America was primed to really believe it. But but if you think about it, like everything you hear about and think about from about Area 51 today did not exist pre-1989, pre-Bob Lazar. It <laughs> all started with Bob Lazar. Yeah. And the reason why everybody wasn't just like, so he's just some nut who came out and said this stuff who cares how did that how did that become truly cemented with area 51 is that weirdly some of the stuff he talked about kind of held water like he would talk about just mundane day-to-day stuff that went on at area 51 um that seemed to uh be able to be correlated from locals yeah like it, it, it held up um there is a um there was a scanner once. He said that you would get in and out of rooms by scanning your hands, and it would scan the bone structure of your hand. That was how you were identified and could come in and out of rooms. And supposedly somebody found, year, like 30 years later, mention of something like that in some declassified report about Area 51. Um, he also, and this is what really kind of legitimized him, he would take people out on, on Wednesday nights. Mm-hmm. And at the time, he would say, I never saw what time it was, but at the time he said it would happen, lights would rise up in the sky and they would do all sorts of UFO-y kind of stuff. And the <laughs> fact that he knew about these schedules really kind of added legitimacy to his claims. Yeah, and the, the new interview that I saw, he was uh, explaining some of the uh, anti-gravitational uh, propulsion mm-hmm. technology that the aliens had supposedly used that he was supposedly assigned to reverse engineer. Right. And he was sort of walking uh, walking the person through it that was in the room and he was like, oh yeah, and he said, we had this thing, it was sort of like half a basketball and when you went to put your hand on it, he was like, there was this, he was, it was like bringing two magnets, you know, opposite poles, to, or is it opposite poles that repel? Mm-hmm. And he said, that's kind of what it felt like and he said, so we would drop like a golf ball and it would just, you know, skirt off to the side without hitting it, and like as if it had bounced. And he, the way he was describing it, I was just like, this guy just seems so credible. Right. It was so like shocking. I didn't know what to expect. I thought he was, I thought he was not going to be credible. I guess. Right. Um, I didn't see the the interview with him, but um, I read about that technology. And um, and by the way, everybody, you can erase your email. It's like poles that repel each other, Chuck. Not <laughs> okay, yeah, right? Um, the uh, the 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 anti gravity technology I was talking about was basically saying like around the craft or whatever that they were reverse engineering, it would bend gravity so this could just move right through space, basically at light speed. Yeah. That's the big suspicion among UFOlogists who follow this stuff is that they were reverse engineering light speed aircraft that was propelled using anti-gravity technology on engines that were matter, anti-matter engines. And, and back in 1989, you couldn't, there wasn't an internet to start with, but even if there was, you couldn't find stuff like descriptions of anti-gravity craft at the time. So for this guy to just come out and start talking about this in an authoritative way, yeah, he he's an enigmatic figure for sure. But he was also one whose credibility was questioned right out of the gate too, right? Yeah, I mean, he says that he went to MIT and to Caltech. Uh, there are no records of him being a student. Um, uh, the conspiracy theorists will say, like, you know how easy it is for the government to wipe that clean? Right. Um, Do you? Yeah, I'm like, I don't know. Is that easy? <laughs> uh, so that's what they will say. Um, they uh, will also say that they also, like, got in touch with his professors to make sure they never talked and stuff like that. But yeah. that's when I get a little bit like you, you can't you can't have hundreds of people or thousands of people involved in some big <laughs> massive cover up. Right. Like someone's gonna talk. Yeah. You're just not thinking big enough. <laughs> I I agree with you. That's when it kind of starts to get hinky for me. But, but he but, did disappear and so I mean not disappear, 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 but he uh <clears throat> 
I mean, it's not like he was like, all right, and now I'm going to go make all the money on this. Right, exactly. Like he moved and tried to start like a regular business and tried to just not be in the public eye. Yeah, he did, which I think adds to his credibility even more, you know? A little bit. Uh, Let's take our last break and then come back, shall we? Let's do it. But let's promise we're going to come back. Okay. (laughs) All right. Learning things with Chuck and Josh. Stuff you should know. Okay, Chuck. So Bob Lazar um, comes along just starts spouting out at the mouth about all the crazy alien stuff that's going on at Area 51. And then he kind of like fades into the background for a while. And everybody else kind of took it from there. If you have anything to do with government conspiracies or believe in UFOs or aliens or whatever, all that stuff started to get saddled little by little onto Area 51. And one of the things um, that pretty early on got connected to Area 51, but almost across the board any reasonable source or skeptical source will say like the two have nothing to do with one another is Roswell and Area 51. Yeah, the the Roswell crash in 1947 Mm -hmm. uh, when something crashed, a gentleman found pieces of an air, well, pieces of some kind of unidentified object and uh, it became UFO central. Later it was, it was, said to be a weather balloon. But first the Army said it was a flying disc. Right. Mm-hmm. That it, kind it of looks, changed things. You've seen the pictures, right? Sure. I mean, it looks like... Um, I've seen that fa- that one famous picture of the guy crouching with what looks like just some balloon material. Yeah. Right. But, you know, he was just a stooge for the government, and that was just a prop <laughs> that they came up with. So the, the Roswell crash happens in 1947. Um <coughs> There's no way Area 51 would have been associated with it. The whole the whole uh, mythos around Roswell is that um, there was a UFO crash that happened. Some aliens survived, or at the very least, their bodies were recovered, depending on who you ask. And the UFO and the aliens, alive or dead, were taken for further study to where? Area 51. Right. Area 51 back in 1947, when the Roswell crash happened, um, was uh, not even on the CIA's radar. It was a that basically a defunct airstrip and a um, nuclear testing range still. Yeah. So there wouldn't have been any place to take the aliens in the first place. And then secondly, after the Roswell crash happened, um, the idea of the an alien um, an alien crash having taken place there that didn't come about until like the eighties too. So really, people started to kind of catch on to this a little late. So probably Area 51 and Roswell have nothing to do with one another. And let's not forget that they're like 800 miles apart, too. Yeah. Even though to everyone in America and really the rest of the world outside of the Southwest thinks they're like right next to each other. <laughs> no, I think so. You know? Yeah. So there have been a lot of crazy theories over the years. Um, the, the very most basic um, are, like you just said, like there's alien corpses there alien technology there Mm -hmm. Uh, and the US military has been studying this stuff and trying to perfect everything from time travel to light speed travel right that's the the basic ground zero uh, approach don't forget interdimensional travel too no why not Um, another one I saw there's some pretty pretty low hanging fruit that I love the moon landing was faked there Uh, sure and then Stanley after Kubrick. that, right? But then after that, Kubrick was executed on site and replaced <laughs> by a clone. <laughs> well, that clone did some great work. He did. Yeah. Um, better than Barry Lyndon, right? <laughs> oh, I love Barry Lyndon. I've never seen it, so I can't really hate on it. Oh, it's amazing. Um, weather control experiments, that's probably the most believable for me. Sure. Cloud seeding? Sure. Why not? Well, why not? Um, and then there's like stage two of, of conspiracy theories. Yes, that is... Uh, there are aliens that clock in every day at Area 51 mm-hmm. and work side by side with us in harmony. <laughs> in harmony in order to build like an alien-human hybrid race, maybe? Sure. 
Um, and if all of this sounds familiar, I will bet that you watched a pretty hefty amount of X Files. Oh yes, because they really tapped into this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, re- they basically yeah. just appropriated it for pro- plot lines. You oh know? yeah, um, which is great. I love the X Files, but it was just I, I guess Chris Carter used to hang out with like ufologists or something just to get ideas. Probably did he really? Or yeah, he had to have. Yeah, I'm, or he is one himself. I don't know much about maybe the guy. so, maybe so. So. Uh, and then, of course, if you even ramp that up a little bit more, that the that this is all part of a giant conspiracy to create a one-world government mm-hmm. that is human-alien run. Right. And that's where um, that Majestic 12 I mentioned at the beginning comes in. They, yeah. they are supposedly a panel of academics, elites, scientists. There's 12 of them who were impaneled by Eisenhower after the Roswell crash. Um, or I guess it would have been Truman, I think, still. Um, who And they were put together, just the, the cream of the crop, to basically go contact the aliens and basically broker a meeting, I guess, between uh, the president and the aliens. And they managed to um, leverage this to catapult themselves into the status of actual people who run the world. Right. So they're the ones who are forming this this one world government and that is where area 51 or that's where it's located the seat of this government is located underground in area 51 yeah this next one is um a little more recent and very kooky um and it's it's the notion that hitler and stalin got together and hatched a plan Mm -hmm. to uh undermine the united states in world war ii by distracting us about the threat of an impending alien invasion. Mm-hmm. And they would do this by building a fake spaceship, filling it with mutant children <laughs> that uh, Joseph uh, Mengele created, right. and um, fill the spaceship with those kids. And then the, the craft crashed in a storm, mm-hmm. and that was the Roswell incident. Right, it was meant to land, and then these mutant children come out. <laughs> Speaking s- German. Suppo- right, supposedly the mu- mutant children, who were the aliens that were found in the Roswell crash, had huge heads and yeah. giant eyes. They were basically like the greys of alien legend. Right. Um, and that Stalin and Hitler were inspired by the public's reaction in America to the world the War of the Worlds broadcast. They wanted to incite that kind of panic um, by actually creating this fake alien invasion. With all the drugs Hitler was on, after we know this now, uh-huh. who knows? I'm sure he's like, yeah, 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 that's a great idea. That's a great idea, man. Let's, what else you got? What else you got? What else can we do? <laughs> <laughs> Stalin's like, mellow. <laughs> you tried CBD? <laughs> he's like, no, that's the one thing I haven't tried. You got any? <laughs> right. I'll bet it'll mix well with everything else. So this is this is obviously not a thing either. Well, this is from a book by um, an author named uh, Annie Jacobson, I believe. And she, this book came out in 2011, and she based this whole thing on uh, an alleged Area 51 insider who was her source, who said that he worked on a project um, that had to do with this somehow, some way, but that this, this was where all of this alien stuff came from. It was a it was a hoax by the Nazis and the Soviets. Yeah. Um, the weird thing is, is there is another guy out there who supposedly has a different source who tells the same story, but this other source um, says that this is the, the, it was all fake. That I saw the files myself, but I believe that it was meant to be a test of loyalty, right? Or to see how I would react working at Area 51 to files like this and, and be like, oh, my God, this is real. This is real. I can't believe this is this is actually real. So just, I guess to see how gullible you were and therefore how trustworthy you were. Right, which could explain Bob Lazar's situation, too, because he was supposedly in a room full of files that he probably shouldn't have seen either. Right. So that that's, He probably failed the test. You got three different sources who supposedly worked at Area 51. Technically, I should say because we'll get email. Bob Lazar worked at S4, which is an even more secret installation that's attached to Area 51. Yeah. But you got three people who allegedly worked in Area 51 who all tell a story about basically being left in a room with files that contained information about aliens, whether it was a hoax or real or whatever. And maybe that is because that kind of correlates with the idea that there were like gunpoint interrogations to 
verify your allegiance to the government or the military or whatever. Maybe that is something they tried there. Yeah. It doesn't make the actual aliens real. It just makes the presence of the files real. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. So Area 51 today, uh, as it truly exists, um, if you're driving down Highway 375, there's an unmarked dirt road between mile markers 29 and 30, or I guess 30 and 29. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, you turn on that road. It's 12 miles on a dirt road, and you'll get to a gate, right. and there'll be warning signs all along saying restricted area, sort of like close encounters type stuff. Um, there will there will be cameras and sensors everywhere, so don't think you're, like, getting away with anything. No, there's there's mics that listen to your conversation. Oh, like, yeah. you were you were under as close surveillance as you've ever been in your life, from what I understand. Yeah, and there are guards, of course, and they will say, I'm sorry, turn around and drive back to the highway. And if you persist a little bit, um, then you will get arrested. Um, If you're around the perimeter area, kind of walking around with your binoculars, Mm -hmm. um, they will probably come and take your binoculars and tell you to leave or drive you um, back to the highway or maybe smash your face in and bury you in the desert. Well, there's a sign that says use of deadly force is authorized. Oh, I'm sure. Um, but there, there's, from what I've seen, there's never been an incident that, that where that actually happened. You're much more likely to get handed over to the local cops who will slap you with a several hundred dollar fine. Sure. If you, if you give them any kind of guff and don't leave immediately when they tell you to. So kind of the cool thing about Area 51, there are, um, obviously, the, I mean, there are civilian workers that work there. It's a huge facility mm-hmm. that apparently is still growing. Um, because you can look at satellite photographs and uh, year by year it seems to be getting bigger and bigger with more buildings. Right. Uh, if you work there, and um, I mean, they have to have everything from food services to uh, custodial services to plumbing and electricians and stuff like that. And all of those people have the highest possible security clearance uh, uh, an American can have. Oh, sure. So they don't drive down that dirt road and just go to the gate and say, how you doing, Rick? And they go, come on in, Jane. <laughs> uh, they go to McCarran Airport in Las Vegas, mm-hmm. and they all get on a big, basically, air taxi. Um, it's a 737 passenger jet mm-hmm. uh, that fly. They call them the Janet Jets. It's under the call sign Janet. They're white with a big, thick red stripe. You can look it up online. Yeah. And they, uh, that's how they get to work every day. They fly everyone in on a 737. And you can see them on the tarmac. They just... Get in with the regular planes. Yeah. It, it's just look for the giant 737s that are white with the red stripe and Pretty cool. no logo, no nothing. They don't actually have a name. Like you said, they fly under call sign Janet. It's, people have tried to figure out forever what Janet means. There's an idea that it's just another non-existent terminal. It stands for that. Mm-hmm. Or Joint Air Network for Employee Transportation. Mm-hmm. But if you go visit the ne- uh, Nevada Aerospace Hall of Fame, They tell the story that there was a commander of Area 51 named Richard A. Sampson from 1969 to 71, and he chose his wife's name, Janet, to identify the commuter shuttles. That's sweet. And that's that's the most romantic, (laughs) super-secret government story of all. (laughs) So we kind of teased earlier on that um, the government is no longer saying, like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Like, no, this satellite image that we're all looking at of buildings— I don't see anything but dirt. Um, That's all changed a little bit now Mm -hmm. uh, because of a lawsuit. Uh, In the mid-1990s, there were a group of uh, workers from Area 51 that sued the government because of the – it's an environmental disaster there. uh, Or, you know, maybe that's changing now, but it had been for many, many years because of the fact that it's a black project and so unregulated that they were just basically – doing everything like dumping hazardous waste and burning it in trenches. And people were there just inhaling these fumes right. and getting really sick. And a guy named Robert Frost uh, that worked there, an employee, <laughs> um, had a lot of really bad health problems. Doctor said, you were suffering from some kind of a really bad chemical reaction. And in order to treat it, we need to know what it is. And the government said, sorry, we can't tell you that. And yeah. he died. He died, and some other co-workers filed this lawsuit, and one of them ended up dying, too. And they finally got to, like, a, a Nevada, I think, or a federal circuit court that said, no, you guys don't have a right to know what, what you've been exposed to. 
Yeah, they weren't looking for money. They just wanted no. to know what was killing them. And, th- and the reason that they had no legal right to know was, and this is that that trial that I was referring to earlier, where the government representatives were saying, like, we like the place that they're talking about doesn't exist. Sorry. Right. So imagine like trying to just get past that barrier. Right. Yeah. You're suing the government to find out what they were burning that made you sick. But the government's in court saying, like, the place that they're talking about doesn't even exist. That's, like, that's obstacle one. Yeah. But the whole reason that they were burning this stuff in the first place is because um, Area 51 operates under what's called the mosaic theory. And the mosaic theory is is that any little piece of information a spy gets his or her hands on could be fit together with other information to to provide a larger picture of what what's being done at Area 51. And as a result, nothing can come out of Area 51. Um, Like the chemical that's killing the people. Right. Or computers that go in and are used. Once they get decommissioned, they get put in this pit and these trenches. And every two weeks, they go out there with jet fuel and everything that's been put into the trenches over the last two weeks gets doused with jet fuel and set on fire with road flares. Amazing. And whatever is in that smoke, the workers get exposed to because for some reason they built the trenches upwind of this um, this installation rather than downwind. And so people were exposed to this every two weeks for years and years and years. And things like, you know, um, anti-radar paint, um, the jet fuel that they were using as an accelerant, I'm sure, wasn't helping. But just all sorts of exotic materials that was super, super classified. The, 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 this is what was killing these people. Alien skin. Or making them sick, exactly. And the government said, no, this is just too classified. These people can't know. They're just going to have to go off and die untreated because we're not going to say publicly what, what they were exposed to. Yeah, and that's, that's where it stood. That case, uh, they did finally... Finally, in that case, say, okay, there's an Area 51. I know. The whole courtroom <laughs> went out for beers that day afterward. So there's a thing there, and uh, that's really all we can say, sorry, mm-hmm. is there's a thing there. But that was the very first sort of uh, insight into the just that admission that there was something there was the first time that had ever happened, right. which is in the mid-1990s. Yeah. And um, I, I, you were saying, like, people would point to satellite images of the place, and you can see that it's growing now. Like, you can see it on, like, Google Maps. Yeah. That is really new because it wasn't very long ago where all the satellites in space were controlled by the government, and the government could control what ended up uh, in satellite images. So they blocked out anything, any image of Area 51. But as private firms started launching their own satellites, it became basically impossible. So yeah. just little by little, it's it's becoming to the point now where they're like, yes, they acknowledge something's there. No, you can't know what's going on there. It's basically the status quo now. Pretty much. So that's Area 51. And sorry, we kind of took the government tack here and uh, didn't really go all in on the alien theories. But I just don't think that's what it is. No. Uh, if you want to know more about Area 51, um, I guess just start reading about it. There's some pretty interesting stuff out there. And since I said that, it's time for listener mail. Uh, this is about nicknames. This is from Rob Bob. Oh, yeah. I love this one. Hey, guys. My name is Rob Bob. Rob and Bob combined into a singular form. Uh, like Jim Bob, but better. <laughs> My mom has explained to me that it started when I was about six months old. Uh, I was a really chunky kid, like in the 99th percentile for weight. Uh, they felt n- like no other nickname like Robbie or Bobby fit, so they started calling me Rob Bob. Um, many years later, I meet my wife, uh, which is almost eight years ago now, and quickly found out that her favorite writer is uh, Richard Wright. And since reading his novel, Native Son, has wanted to name her kid Richard to honor the impact he had on her life. She had visited his grave in Paris and has every book he ever published. Um, When she met me, I told her about my super nicknames that I'd wanted to call my kid. Because, you see, my father is William, Bill for short, but now, since we came up with these weird names, I call my dad Will Bill to (laughs) bug him. This leads me to why uh, I have always wanted to name my child Richard since high school. Then we would, in order, have a Will Bill, a Rob Bob, and a Rick Dick. All in three generations of awesomeness. My wife does not approve and thinks we should look elsewhere for name ideas. 
With great admiration, Rob, Bob, and Rachel. Thanks. Thanks, Rob, Bob. Good luck with that, with your your quest. Yeah, I don't think Rick Dick is going to fly in your household. (laughs) I don't think so either. (laughs) Rachel may may have the cooler head here. I think so. Uh, Well, if you want to get in touch with us like Rob, Bob did, we would love that. You can go on to stuffyoushouldknow.com, check out our social links there, or you can send us an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.